Hi, good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Nenokuda Kuma from uh, Chemical Engineering. And most of you are this students and postdocs, some of in our group and uh, people from mass departments. Great. Um, Professor Nenokuda Kuma has, uh, has been at LSU for six, seven years? No, no, three years. It's three years <laughs> only, sorry. <laughs> but before that, he has uh, a lot of experience uh, research and teaching in Canada, uh, over three decades of research and teaching experience. And he got his PhD from Princeton University in 1979, received a lot of awards from the uh, Canadian Society of Engin Chemical Engineering, and uh, uh, also the fellow of the uh, Canadian Academy of Engineering, it's so equivalent to the U.S. Academy of Engineering. Um, he, al he was also a chief, actor in chief in Canadian of Canadian Journal of Chemical Engineering uh, during 2005, 2009. Uh, he's going to share us with his uh, research on uh, various computer models on of multi phase uh, flow, uh, especially in chemical processes. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. I want to thank uh, CCP for this opportunity to uh, share some of my research interests that have a common interface with the computational aspect, uh, which is what CCP is about. Um, so I will bring in the chemical engineering side of it and show how we are using computer models to understand uh, chemical processes. Uh, <coughs> I thought this audience would be predominantly non-chemical engineers because being in CCT, but I see a lot of you are chemical engineers. Uh, but still, I will like to give an idea of what chemical engineering is for those who are uh, from outside of the field. Uh, wh what do chemical engineers do? Essentially, we do three things. Uh, we don't like to leave nature in its natural state. We dig them up, uh, produce crude oil, for example, or produce minerals from that extract uh, more useful material for various uh, products. So we basically separate things that are mixed. If you take distillation, absorption, extraction, these are all various unit operations that chemical engineers design, run, uh, operate. And they are designed to separate things. If you take crude, for example, we want to separate into gasoline, aviation fuel, uh, diesel fuel, etc. Then we mix things that are separated and this is when we want to have two reactants uh, mixed together to form a new product. Okay. So there are ma many equipments, again, used for that, stir tanks, twin screw extruders, blenders, inline mixers, etc. And uh, we change the nature of the molecule. Okay. These two are physical operations. The third one is a chemical uh, in nature, where we change the nature of the chemical species. Uh, there are lots of examples. Uh, one that we may be familiar with is taking ethylene to produce polyethylene, the plastic. And I'll show you one uh, reactor that is used, for example, uh, in today's presentation. So there are various types of reactor configurations that are used in, in the chemical industry. And uh, if you ask the question, where did chemical engineers evolve from? We evolved from industrial chemists. Initially, chemists are the ones who developed these new chemical species. Uh, and uh, engineers basically scale up, design, and run. Uh, so all those things are discovered on a bench scale and then transplanted into the large uh, scale that you will see all along the Mississippi River. There are $200 billion worth of chemical companies here. So there is really an opportunity for us to interact with them and ask them to support our research. And that's one of my goal in terms of taking this talk and presenting to anybody who is willing to listen uh, and willing to do that. So in the early 1900s, the first synthesis of what chemical engineering occurred when an industrial inspector visited several manufacturing plants that manufacture sulfuric acid or ammonia. Uh, but they were not talking to each other, just like I guess here we are not talking to each other. And uh, so this guy who was visiting many plants saw the same unit operations. The term, the concept unit operations did not exist at that time. So he saw that you guys are using the same device that the uh, sulfuric acid plant is using, so, but you don't know how these things operate. You don't communicate with each other. So the concept of a unit operation, the unit that does a specific task that can be deployed in different industries, emerged at that time. That was the first level of synthesis. The second level of synthesis occurred in the 50s in the US. This occurred in England. Okay, this occurred in the US. 
uh, where the power of mathematics was realized and pushed for, uh, forward by uh, leading chemical engineers like Neil Emerson and his group in University of Minnesota. So they saw that if you write down the mass balance equations or any equation governing these processes, the mathematical structure is the same even though the uh, processes could be completely different. Okay, so there is a unity in terms of if you can study and understand the dynamics of A going to B, where A and B could be any chemical species. So your second level of abstraction takes place. And that, that introduced the power of mathematics, which revolutionized chemical engineering education uh, in the US and then it spread throughout the world. Uh, classic books by Burr Stewart and Lightfoot and uh, Mathematical Methods and uh, Chemical Engineering by Amundsen are all examples of those. And uh, the third level of synthesis uh, is the development of uh, process simulators that these, some of these models that we developed here are so complicated, in very limited cases we can analytically study them. But with the advance of computers, we are able to now look at in detail the dynamics of what happens inside each one of these process vessels that I'm talking about. So that's what my talk is today about. I'm going to give you a few examples where we have studied that. And uh, these are all multi-phase flows. There are at least two phases, often three phases, gas, solid, liquid, uh, engaged in separation, in mixing, in reaction, etc. So computers are beginning to play an important role. So CCT should obviously be interested in this development of what is happening in chemical industry. Uh, a few slides about the nature of research. Okay. Uh, the early nature of research was thought about as a linear model where a chemist, for example, in the chemical industry does some bench scale experiment, very basic uh, experiment to understand uh, the nature of the reactions. And from that we take and develop some of the ideas that look promising into, that would lead into a product. So we have applied research, which is the basic research is thought of as typically being done in uh, academia and applied research being done in uh, industrial labs. So the R&D in industrial labs became very prominent when they were able to take this and apply and develop it into a product. So that's a very linear model and uh, subsequently this idea of research has been revised and one of them is called the Pasteur's Quadrant where you ask the question, if I'm doing research, is that research going to lead to a new understanding along the vertical axis, or is it going to lead to a new use on the horizontal axis? Based on that, you classify the research into various parts. For example, Neil Bohr's understanding of the atomic structure leads to new understanding, but not necessarily to a new single product. Okay. Whereas Edison, the work of Edison, is driven by developing new use using existing understanding of uh, nature. Okay? And Pasteur's work is considered as a classic example where both are achieved at the same time in terms of what is the impact of microbes uh, on the disease processes. So it reveals a new understanding but also offers new solutions on how to control the disease process, for example. And the fourth quadrant where nobody wants to be would be one that is neither adds to new understanding nor to new use which will be like the measuring the density of water as an example. Okay? So ideally, I guess we would like to be in this corner, but being engineers, we are probably more often in this corner. And I will try to kind of point out where we are doing some fundamental work in terms of developing new algorithms and uh, understanding how they work and uh, applying them to uh, process industries. And then there was another, uh, these are slides are all taken from the web at different places. I've I identified the source. Uh, a more complicated image of what research is about and uh, it's a more integrated web of information going from one side to the other side. One aspect is take existing understanding using pure basic research improve our understanding. And that process goes on all the time from Newton's law to Einstein's. We continuously refine our understanding of uh, uh, the nature. On the other end, take existing technology and through pure applied R&D, develop improved technology. That's what most of the R and industrial R&D is about. But there is a cross flow of information, existing understanding, user inspired basic research. You can develop products, new products, or you can take existing technology and ask more fundamental questions, trying to understand why certain thing works that way. So it can add to improved understanding. So uh, in reality, this is due to John Fauchner from Medical Sciences. Uh, in reality, the research spans the entire spectrum, so you cannot really box them into any one of these uh, pictures. There's a continuous spectrum of 
from the pure research to applied research. Uh, here are two examples of how t technology can be transformative uh, through incremental improvement in the design process. Okay? So on the left hand side you see a model T and on the right hand side you see a modern Porsche. And it took probably 1900 years to get from here to there, not through any revolutionary conceptual understanding, improvement understanding, but through incremental improvement in the design. Okay? And that is an important part of our progress. And same thing, another example from aeronautical uh, engineering would be the Wright Brothers original plane and the modern uh, Dreamliner. You can see a, a significant in improvement and this was not achieved overnight. If you ask the question, how is the chemical industry doing with respect to incremental improvement? And you see two pictures here. They are both distillation columns. You will see them if you drive along uh, I-10. Uh, they, they basically are used for separating the crude, etc. And the technology has not improved. Okay, it's essentially the same technology. It works and uh, the industry is happy with it. So what we are saying is that th there are opportunities for us to understand what happens inside and improve their performance. And this is the kind of thing that we want to engage uh, with the industry. So really what happens inside this vessel is there are two phases, a vapor phase that is going up and the liquid phase that is coming down, flowing across, coming down, flowing across, etc. As this occurs, the more vo lighter, more volatile material will be transferred to the vapor. So they will be found on the top. And the heavier material will flow with the liquid and they will be found at the bottom. And you you uh, develop a temperature gradient and you can draw products at different levels that will give you different cuts of products from gasoline to aviation fuel to uh, diesel fuel, etc. So this is the internal dynamics of how it looks. Okay, This is a picture from uh, Fractionation Research Incorporated. So this is a zone called weeping zone where the vapor traffic upwards is not very high. So the liquid can flow down from the tray above. Okay, and it's called, called a weeping zone. And that's not a very good zone to be operating in because what we want is good mixing between the vapor and the liquid so that the mass transfer of the lighter material from the liquid phase to the vapor phase will occur. This is the ideal regime that we would like to operate. It's called the froth regime. So there is nice bubbling of the liquid and the bubbles uh, on the liquid, on the tray. And uh, here is a situation where the vapor flow is so high that the, velo the velocity of the gas is so high that it carries the liquid droplets to the tray above. And that counter is counterproductive because we are mixing instead of separating. And uh, so the ideal regime would be to operate on this. And how do we find all this? By doing experiments in the lab. If you ask the question, can computation help us in trying to understand that? The answer is partially yes and partially no. And that's what we need to understand fundamentally why we can make improvements in certain aspects and not in others. So the traditional way of understanding multiphase flow, a quote due to a very famous fluid dynamicist, G.K. Bachelor, is to divide and conquer. Okay, because the flow is so complicated, it changes the patterns, etc. So you identify a flow map and you say if you're operating in this regime for the liquid rate and vapor rate, you're going to be in the froth regime. And that's what we would like to operate on. If you cross that boundary, we go into the spray regime or the emulsion regime or the bubble or the flooding. We want to avoid those things. But the question is, can a model, a mathematical model, uh, allow us to predict wh which region we are going to be in, the answer is no. At this stage, the answer is no. And there is some hopeful uh, thing to look for in terms of we may be able to do it in the next 10, 15 years if we continuously engage in understanding the dynamics within each region first. Okay, this is an example of a single tray that you'll find in a distillation column. I'm just showing the scale of it here. You can see that uh, compared to this person, it's a very large tray probably 20 feet in diameter. The liquid will come down through this and will flow across. And there are lots of tiny bubbles, thousands of tiny holes. Through these holes, the bubbles will uh, come from the bottom to the top. And there is a weir that blocks and keeps a pool of liquid. And the liquid has to overflow that down into the next tray below. Okay? So that is the dynamics of what happens in a distillation column as an example. The dynamics of this is, in principle, governed by this equation. And we all know what this equation is essentially Newton's law of motion applied to the fluids. So it's a Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, all the secrets of fluid mechanics, Newtonian fluid mechanics, I suppose, is hidden in this, as long as you assume it's a linear relationship between the stress and the rate of strain there. Okay? Uh, <coughs> and this is how we used to design distillation columns. And I guess we still do in some sense. 
This method was developed at MIT in 1925. It's a graphical method. You, of course, the principles are conservation of mass. And uh, you make a lot of assumptions to make a design procedure possible. And two of the key assumptions are something called the constant molar overflow, which makes possible a linear, op what is called a linear operating line. Okay. And uh, uh, the other assumption that we make is a well mixed uh, stage. And that is far from the truth. That stage is never well mixed. And, but if we relax that, we are not able to develop any design procedure. Okay, so t even today, the design procedure is based on these two assumptions. The first assumption can be relaxed in, uh, was relaxed, I guess, in the 80s when we started developing process simulators that are kind of a lumped models inside what happens in a distillation tree. Okay, if you look at the evolution of the process design and uh, what we are advocating, myself and my colleagues uh, working in the multiphase area, is that there is a change in the design paradigm for how chemical processes could be designed in future. And I'm going to give you a glimpse of what, what that process is going to be uh, looking like. But in the early 20s, we had basically graphical methods. We didn't have computers, we didn't have calculators, pencil and paper and graph. That's all we, we, we had to design. In the 47, I guess the first computers were introduced, and in 80s, these process simulators started appearing as a tool to help understand and uh, design and operate these plants. And I guess uh, in 1994, apparently more computers were sold than televisions, so showing the dominance of computers in the society. But in 2000 onwards, this advanced simulation-based engineering and science has emerged as a way of understanding various processes, natural processes, engineering processes, this we can do over a whole range of scales, and I'm going to give you a slide to give you uh, what those scales are. The basic point is that computers have started playing an important role in our understanding of chemical process equipment, so we can use that to design better uh, equipment in the future, or take the existing equipment and operate them in a better fashion, meaning we can increase the throughput, we can increase the productivity, uh, of existing because they are all designed, over designed in some sense because of the ignorance that we have. Uh, so here is a specific example of what happens in a distillation tray. It's a single tray, computational model. This was done by a master's uh, student, uh, uh, Gaetia Gesset in uh, 2003. So you have the liquid coming through this, flowing across and overflowing. And we have these holes through which the vapors will come. And we're trying to understand the fluid mechanics only, not the mass transfer in this world, just the fluid mechanics. And uh, here is uh, some results on how the vapor fraction of the vapor and the liquid looks. For example, if you have a red color, that indicates it's a liquid-rich region. Okay? So the liquid that overflows this accumulates in here, and it will start going across the next plane below. And a white one would mean that it is a purely vapor space region. And in between, you have both of them nicely bubbling. Okay? These are at various flow rates for the liquid and various flow rates for the gas but they're all operating in the froth regime. Okay, and uh, here is a picture of how a path line for a particular liquid or a vapor will look like. So we get some visual picture of how the dynamics uh, is inside. But what is very important for us is to know how the velocity changes across. Okay, so experimentation is very important and collaboration for us with experimentalists working in multiphase area is very important because they are the ones who provide us with the data. This is the data that was published in 1986. What they did was using a fiber optic probe, they measured the velocity, liquid velocity variation across the tree. And uh, so we took their data and uh, compared it against with our simulation. So the stars here are the experimental data points. Of course, experimental data points are available only at discrete locations. And the uh, solid lines are basically what we predict from computational fluid dynamic modeling of the gas-liquid uh, interchange. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, what kind of models, what kind of ideas are used to do these um, uh, simulations. I'm just giving you an example of what kind of data we can get out of such a CFD simulation at this stage. Uh, we have worked on a whole number of different problems, very practical problems. Currently, for example, we have work going on in the oil spill modeling, trying to understand the dynamics. It's a very complex process. And I'll show you some of the results. And then we have worked, uh, we have done a lot of work on heavy oil with sand because I was working in Alberta, that was an important part. Similarly, the progressive cavity pumps that are used in oil fields, understanding the fluid mechanics inside that. The gravity separation vessel is a vessel that is used in oil sands, but it is also used in sugar industry here. 
and we have done some work on that uh, uh, through simulation. I will share that with you. I won't have the time to go through the entire range of problems. Each one I can give us one hour seminar. Uh, but uh, my goal here is to kind of expose and show the range of problems that can be studied within the same common framework of multiphase flow modeling and uh, what we can understand from them. So I'm not going into the computational algorithmic details today, but on the application side, what kind of information we can extract out of them. Um, so a few slides on what my plans are uh, for integrated research in the multiphase flow area uh, in LSU and uh, surrounding institutions. Uh, so we have formed something called a multi-phase cluster in the College of Engineering with four different faculty members and we have organized a workshop in February where we had invited several people from industry and government and uh, uh, academia and that start get, got started a discussion in this area and I want to continuously engage in that kind of a discussion. Our goal is to look at industrial scale applications involving multi-phase flow with the goal of intensifying the process operations, existing operations, or designing new equipment in the future using this technology. And the problems are very varied. We have multi-phase reactors, as I talked about in the very first slide, turbulent non-Newtonian flow regimes, and uh, the applications is very broad. You have petroleum in industry, where you, you can apply this technique, chemical industry, food processing industry, sugar industry. So there are a lot of opportunities for taking this technology and applying it to uh, number of industrial processes in this area, uh, geographical area. And to advance a fundamental understanding and modeling of multi-phase flow. This is where when I talked about user-inspired research leading to better understanding, so we want to be involved in developing some advanced algorithms so that we can solve even bigger problems in the future. And uh, bring the economic benefit to industry. So if we interact with them and show them how these tools can be used, and if they can, in one equipment, if we can improve their performance by 2%, they'll probably uh, reap two, billion, two million, three million dollars every year. And if they give us back only one percent of it, we can build on it, right? So that is the idea I think that uh, I, I want to convey. Uh, th this was my first uh, failed attempt at LSU in the fir very, very first year. I started uh, putting together an aggregate uh, proposal. And uh, I, it was a very educational experience for me because I got to know various people working in different departments. The basic idea is you have a chemical company which needs help and we have graduate students who need training and we combine these two and put them through a process that will help in developing improved processes and well-trained engineers who can be engaged in this activity. But the process would be something like this. We need to understand, go into the existing plant and understand through process diagnostics what kind of equipment needs improvement among the many equipment that they have. Okay. So internship is an important part of this. Even faculty members should go and spend some time there, and I plan to do that starting this summer. Okay. And then using that knowledge, using Aspen type of model, we try to understand which process equipment by a detailed examination could benefit the most uh, in terms of imp uh, improving their performance. Then comes, this is my part of expertise, advanced multi-phase flow modeling. So we are going to use CFD to develop detailed models, like the one that I showed you, for example, in the distillation column. Okay. And I need help with advanced multi-phase experimentalists. So I have teamed up with two people, for example, uh, one from Ag Center and one from Mechanical Engineering. I will show the, the group. And uh, so by talking to each other, we develop a model that is a good representation of what happens in a chemical equipment. We can then use that for process improvement, process intensification, and even we can develop reduced order models from that and use that for process optimization and process control. So we need people with expertise in all these areas working together uh, to solve industrial problems, train graduate students, but at the same time improve. We achieve what automotive industry achieved from the model T to the modern push. We want to take this highly polluted current chemical company and change it into something that is very clean and uh, uh, environmentally friendly. So this is a core group of people that have come together and we want to expand uh, as more people are interested in that. And that's myself in chemical engineering and Dr. Dimitris Nikitopoulos, chair of the mechanical engineering, experimental expertise on multi-phase flow. Professor Vadim Kuchirjan, uh, who is a chemical engineer, but he works on renewable energy resource and he has built a very beautiful pilot plant scale facility in Audubon Sugar Institute. 
uh, and then Mayan Tiagi from Petroleum Engineering, who is already associated with CCP, uh, who is uh, bringing us the petroleum engineering expertise with computational expertise as well. So the four of us are going to engage in the next year or two in forming a research cluster that may lead to other bigger things in future. And our goal is the following. We have, we will, the concept is that we will have clusters of research uh, groups in different places interacting with each other. So this will be, for example, at uh, LSU, uh, chemical and mechanical engineering, but interacting with the chemical industry here. And CCT hopefully will give us support in terms of the computational infrastructure, et cetera. And uh, I, I have worked in this uh, institute previously in Abu Dhabi. This is Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. They also have a whole spectrum of industries from uh, gas plants to refineries to petrochemical plants. And they have an academic institute that is just being built. So there is a lot that we can gain both ways by interacting, having faculty and student interchange. So I'm trying to kickstart that process. Uh, it, when you start any new process, it is not easy, but uh, we are working hard on it. And then there are, uh, I have visited the University of Calgary to give a seminar in November. They are interested in being part of this, and there are a few people working in multi case flow there. Similarly, University of Houston, University of Florida, etc. So we need to expand this, and then we can approach uh, and develop much stronger center like proposals in the future uh, in this area. Uh, I'm going to talk about in the next phase uh, a little bit details of the types of models that we are developing. Okay? One is called the two fluid interpenetrating continuum model, TFM. Uh, the model fidelity here is not very high, but it will give us information about what are the nature of the heterogeneous distribution inside any process vessel, whether it's a fluidized bed reactor or a distillation column. Uh, then we have something called a discrete particle modeling, which is Navier-Stokes equation coupled with particle dynamics. And we have parallelized this, and we can handle maybe up to 10 million particles. And we are using that as a model to understand the dynamics in fluidized bed reactors and uh, pneumatic conveying, se sedimentation, et cetera. And then we have the direct numerical simulation, which is the most high, high, highest fidelity in the range of models, where the coupling between the rigid body dynamics of particles and fluids is very rigorous. Okay, so uh, these kinds of models we are engaged in developing ourselves. For this one, there are a lot of commercial codes that are available. We just take them and use it. For industrial purposes, I think this level of fidelity is adequate which is a lot better than what is currently available in Aspen Hysis type of simulation. So these are in the research phases at, na uh, at this stage, but we can extract information and feed that into the lower level model. So um, in every seminar that I ever given, <laughs> I always use this slide because it is a quotation that covers two of the most inspiring people in my education in my life. Uh, the quotation is from Feynman's book uh, on lecture notes in physics. And the comment is about G.A. Taylor, the very well-known fluid dynamicist. And uh, it drives home a very interesting point, particularly for graduate students. And uh, let me just read the quote and then uh, uh, move on to the next slide. So the main lesson to be learned from Taylor's work is that a tremendous variety of behavior is hidden in the Navier-Stokes equation. All solutions are for the same equation, only with different values of rotational speed. Even that is not true. You can have the same sort of rotational speed and still have different solutions. We have no reason to think that there are any terms missing from these equations. He's talking about this equation. The only difficulty is that we do not have the mathematical power today to analyze them. That we have written an equation does not remove from the flow of fluids its charm or mystery or surprise. And that is still true. Fluid mechanics is one of the most challenging topics. And all the secrets are hidden. And they are hidden in the nonlinearity in this equation. Even if you assume incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, even though this is the, there is no uncertainty, as he points out. If you know, if you assume a fluid to be Newtonian and incompressible, you need only two parameters, density and viscosity. If you know them, there are no other uncertainties in the model. But still, we don't understand the turbulence. We don't understand the multiphase interaction. So there are challenges that will remain for a very long time. And computers are allowing us to unravel some of those challenges, some of those mysteries and surprises. So. Uh, this is a slide that is taken from a beautiful book uh, by Van Dyke, fluid, uh, I think it's an album of fluid motion. So uh, one of the pictures shows how the flow becomes progressively more complicated as you increase the Reynolds number. This is flow past a cylinder or a sphere. 
At very low Reynolds number, Navier Stokes is fine. You can predict everything. If it is creeping flow, in fact, it becomes linear, and there are a lot of analytical tools that you can use to understand. But as you progressively increase the Reynolds number, the inertia becomes important. There is a wake that forms behind, and then the symmetry is broken, and the flow gets very complicated very quickly. And here you have a turbulent flow. So in a turbulent flow, if you put a probe and measure the velocity profile at a particular point, you're going to get a signal that's chaotic, that's reproduce, uh, not reproducible. That is, if you measure the velocity profile at a point here you, using an LDA probe, you will get a very steady signal. The flow is steady, and uh, you can understand it. We can predict it. So here is two such time series from a turbulent flow measurement. And you see that they, are, they look completely different. They are at the same point in a flow, but at two different times and they look completely different. That is the nature of the turbulent flow. Okay, but if you look at the statistics, that is how many times a particular velocity has occurred, construct a histogram, you'll find that the histogram is identical for both of them. Okay? So that statistics, the characteristics of the flow on certain suitable larger scale uh, view that does have some invariance that you can use to understand turbulent flow. But if your goal is to predict what is the velocity of turbulent flow at a particular point, you're not going to be able to do that. And it's not necessary also. And the same situation occurs when you have multi-phase flow. Okay? So this basically shows the idea of time averaging from the Navier-Stokes. So everything flows from the Navier-Stokes equation that I showed earlier. If you do the time averaging and smoothing through these mathematical operations, what you will get is a time average Navier-Stokes equation, which has some additional terms, the information that is lost due to the averaging, to, due to the smoothing. So we need to build models. So the turbulence model is about building the information uh, uh, that we lost through the uh, integration process, time averaging process. So the Reynolds stresses and the Reynolds fluxes when you have a convective transport of a species. And uh, we have made good progress in developing models for these. As I said, single phase fluid dynamics is used in automotive and aeronautical industry. And you can design a plane today without ever going into a wind tunnel using CFD and we can have reasonable confidence that it will work. The same situation is not true with uh, multi-phase flow in uh, process equipment. So this slide essentially shows what happens in a multi-phase flow equipment. Imagine that the blue is water and red is oil droplets. Okay? And this essentially shows the concept of volume averaging and what kind of information we lose. So if I take this red, uh, th this yellow circle as my averaging volume and average over that and count what area is covered by blue and what area is covered by red. So I will get a volume fraction for the blue phase and a volume fraction for the red phase that I assign to the center of that dot. Then I move the dot to the next pixel and I do the same thing. Okay? If I do that, I'm smearing the information at the interface. So if my yellow circle is 5 pixels in size, this is the kind of av average picture that I will get. I lose the definition of the interface, crystal clear interface, but I, I can say that there are more red in here than there. And you increase the averaging, volume averaging size, you progressively lose more and more information. The two fluid model falls into this category, an volume averaged equation of motion derived from the navier stokes equation. And what you can say is that this region is rich in oil and that region is rich in water. But imagine that you take this LO to be the entire vessel, then what you get is one value for red and one value for yellow, that is the blue. That is one a average volume fraction for the oil phase in the entire vessel. And that will be true. If you stop the reaction and allow them to separate, you will find that volume fraction as your f volume fraction for the oil and the water phase. But when the, when the equipment is dynamic, this situation can change with time. One time, it may, this may be rich in red. Another time, that may area may be rich in red. But current models, Aspen and Heiss's models, assume a completely homogeneous, well-mixed equipment. And that's the reason for our failure to understand and improve their performance. And CFD, multi-phase CFD, can tell us, the two-fluid model can tell us uh, any heterogeneous, large-scale heterogeneous distribution. It cannot tell us where a particular droplet or where a particular or, uh, solid phase is in at any, every instant of time. But we don't need that. Okay? So the two-fluid model are very pragmatic. We, we are able to get reasonable results in a reasonable amount of time. And I, I'm pushing that as a tool that's most relevant for industrial applications. But the other tools are going to help us in understanding how to devise this uh, two-fluid model. So this is a volume averaging idea that you would use. So if uh, you have a, a piece of equipment that contains solid, liquid, and gas, I'm going to take a center point and assign it to three values, one for the gas phase, one for the solid phase, and one for the liquid phase. 
uh, volume fractions. So this is called interpenetrating continua. So at every point, you will have a value for each one of those field variables, solid, liquid, and gas. And so it's treated as a continuum. You are losing information about specific uh, phase boundaries. And if you apply that volume averaging idea to the Navier-Stokes equation, you're going to get an equation that looks like Navier-Stokes equation with the average velocities, especially average velocities, plus the information that is lost at the interface, the interaction between the phases, the force exerted by the gas phase on the solid phase or the solid phase on the gas phase. It is this information that we need to provide closure. Just like in turbulent flow, we provide the closure models. And here we need to provide closure models for the interface interaction of momentum, heat, and mass. In direct numerical simulation, we will actually be able to compute what this is from simulation because it will be a fully resolved velocity field. So we'll actually know what the stress distribution is on the boundaries. And that's what this integral is. So DNS can provide us information about what type of closure models are needed. Typically, right now, we get this information from experiments. Okay? And then we can use the two fluid model to uh, do the simulation for industrial applications. So if you do the uh, volume averaging, these are the equations that you get for the so-called two-fluid model. That is the basis for most of the commercial simulators that are available in CFD that are widely used. Uh, and anything that you see in red is something that requires additional information from experiments because it contains information that is lost through the volume averaging process. And these are examples of the closure models that we used in our distillation example that I showed you. So the momentum exchange between the gas and the liquid is related to some drag interaction and the square of the slip velocity, the differential velocity between those two phases. And that model works well for the distillation problem I that I showed. Uh, this is the higher fidelity model, what I call the discrete particle modeling. And wh what we have is here we treat the gas phase as a continuum or the liquid phase as a continuum which has discrete particles. And we want to track the uh, location and orientation of the particle at every instant of time. But the particle can exchange momentum with the fluid. And that is handled through this source term in the fluid momentum equation. So we have a fluid phase momentum equation, which looks like an average momentum equation. And then we have particle dynamic equation, which captures the collision between particles. Um, and so there are two var varieties on that. This is essentially rigid body dynamics of impact between two particles. And uh, the, the one is called the time-driven uh, soft, soft, soft sphere model. The other one is the hard sphere model. And using these models, we had a postdoctoral fellow who is now working for ANSYS uh, who developed a code, a highly parallelized code uh, in our own uh, lab. And that is we are using it for studying various types of processes. And this is the highest level of fidelity where we have direct numerical simulation. Uh, this is an algorithm that uh, some of my uh, PhD students developed about five years ago. Essentially, we have the Navier-Stokes equation for the fluid phase and the rigid body dynamic equation for the solid phase. And the solids are suspended in the fluid and they are free to move. And the coupling is rigorous in the sense we calculate the stress distribution from the flow equation and calculate the forces that are exerted on the forces on the torques that are exerted on the particles. Then the particles will move in that fluid. And similarly, as the particles move, they will influence the velocities in the uh, fluid phase. So the coupling is both ways, and it is rigorous. So there is no need for our closure models, as we did in the two fluid model. But there is still a need for modeling the collision. When the two particles come and impact each other, how do we handle that? There are some uncertainties in that as well. And same thing can be done for fluid. fluid. If you have uh, an immiscible fluid, like water in oil droplet, uh, then you have to have the Navier-Stokes equation for two phase, both the phases, but we are tracking the interface uh, accurately. Again, there is no modeling here. There is no smearing of information. There is an interface uh, tracking algorithm. These have been well developed in the last 10, 15 years or so. And this is one, uh, one of our own attempt to develop uh, such a method. Uh, if you look at the models, you can look at models at various scales. And this picture shows you what is the interrelation between these various uh, scales of models. So for example, a chemical engineer or a chemist can look at, at the molecular level, interaction between the two molecules. And if you understand and simulate that, computers are used for molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, you can then predict the material properties like viscosity and density, surface tension, etc., which is what the input that we need for continuum level models in Navier-Stokes equation. But these models also need some input. So any level you choose to look at a particular process, you always need information at a level below, and you're able to predict what happens the uh, level above. So there is a hierarchy of models. 
So for the MD models, you need the interaction potential between the two molecules. You can obtain them either from lab experiment or from a model that is at a lower level, maybe a quantum mechanical calculation. Okay, but we are focusing essentially on these two scales. And currently what industry is doing on this scale using Aspen and Heises, where an equipment is a black box. And you look at what goes into that based on pilot scale experiments, you tune in a lot of parameters in the model and you can predict the process performance. What we are saying is that information that comes from pilot scale, we can get from a more detailed investigation of what happens inside the vessel on the continuum scale. Uh, so if all, all the three models that I talked about, the two fluid model, the discrete part of the modeling, and the direct numerical simulation fall into these two categories of uh, different types of re resolution of the model. So I think I've kind of exhausted almost all my time. How many much of time do I have more? <laughs> we, we started a little later, so I will take the full <laughs> one hour and continue. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the examples that we have looked at. These are all the various examples using various models that we talked about. I'll just give you a flavor of a few more examples. I've already talked about distillation um, column, but I'll give you a few more examples and then conclude my talk with where we are and where we want to go. <coughs> so um, I'm giving you the references for each one of those works gravity separation vessel, polymer blending, that's a fairly significant work. You know, three PhD students that went through that project, and I think there is one postdoc that went through that project, one master's student through this, two PhD students through that. So it's over a period of last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years. Um, so let me just give you uh, a, f a few examples. <coughs> one is a loop uh, reactor dynamics. I think Dr. Rupesh, already a postdoctoral fellow, uh, is working on this one. It is an industrial project and what happens here is um, a reactor which is uh, a loop in a closed loop and you put in propylene or ethylene inside that and seed some catalyst and a polymerization reaction takes place and you get out of that polypropylene or polyethylene etc. And the fluid dynamics in that is fairly complicated <coughs> and what this one shot of scenario shows is the following. If you take a certain instant of time, uh, you find that you would, you would ideally like to have a homogeneous distribution of the particles that are growing with time. The catalyst, uh, on the catalyst, these polymerization reaction uh, is occurring. So polypropylene is growing, for example. We would like to have a homogeneous distribution of both phases, propylene and the reacted product in that. But what happens is because of the pump, there is separation. The centrifugal force throws out the particles that are heavier near the wall. And so in the center, the volume fraction of the particles is low, as indicated by this, but near the wall it is higher. But as it is going up, the particles come to the center. They collapse and they form a slug. Okay? And the slug then, of course, continues to move. So you'll see a series of time frames where the slug dynamics is tracked and the pump power is calculated at various instants of time. So the slug has moved up there, 1.7 seconds, 2.8 seconds, 3.5 seconds, and this process will continue forever. This is not an ideal situation. We want to avoid that. So to understand the dynamics of this, we are working currently on uh, looking at uh, various types of fidelities and trying to understand what causes this aggregation and how we can suppress that. <coughs> uh, a progressive cavity pump is, as I said, it's a device, a complicated device from a fluid dynamics point of view that is used widely in oil industry. Okay. So what you have here is a stator and a rotor inside that. It's a very complicated helical shape and inside that you will have another helix that is rota rot translates. As it translates, it rotates. You will actually see a picture of this. If I can get the animation to work. Okay. So you can see that the, the rotor basically moves the translation motion and the rotation motion that creates a cavity and through the cavity the fluid is pumped. These kinds of pumps are very good for situations where you have multi-phase flow. That is, you're producing oil and water and there is some sand in it. You want to pump all of them to the surface before you can separate them. So this kind of pumps are very good for that kind of an activity. So the fluid dynamic simulation of this will be very complicated because your flow domain keeps changing uh, in time. So here is a simulation that shows uh, the, the constant volume surface. Okay? So it shows how the flow path is. And you can then track and predict what the uh, pressure drop would be, etc. Okay. That's another example. This is an example of a gravity separation vessel which we did when I was in Alberta, but it is also applicable to Louisiana because there are a lot of sugar industries where they want to separate the 
the fibers uh, from the sugar solution before they can uh, concentrate and crystallize it out. So in Alberta, we built a simple device. Again, I'm pointing out the need for experimental validation. We built a device uh, that will uh, look at the solid distribution in a two-phase slurry. So we used water and glass beads, and we'll pump the feed through this, and we'll collect the water through this and the slurries through that. And we wanted to see what the solids concentration is along the vertical line or the horizontal line, and what is the large-scale structure of the flow. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you will see uh, experimental. So these are millions of glass beads in water, suspended in water that is coming up. You can see a large-scale circulation. Okay, and this is from the simulation using CFD of the same situation. You see a similar circulation. But if you ask a question, where is a particular glass bead at an instant of time? You cannot do that kind of a simulation, but you don't need that for separation efficiency and operating this in a more efficient way. But what you need to know is where is the interface above which there is no glass B and how you can control that. Okay, that's an important uh, practical question. So this is our measurements of the solid concentration using a laser probe in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. And you can see that the interface is somewhere there. And both CFD and experiment agree. This basically shows that this, the closure models that we used for doing this two fluid model is adequate. And then industry can take that CFD model and look at how to optimize their feed zone, which is the zone somewhere here, so that they reduce the intensity of turbulence so that settling occurs in a more efficient way. And after coming here, Rupesh has been doing this design modification for the sugar industry based on the work uh, done by Professor Kocherjan uh, at the Audubon Sugar Institute. So he has looked at various alternate designs. The goal is to keep the entire flow domain as quiet as possible minimize the intensity of turbulence so that gravity can do the job of separating the heavy solids uh, from the liquid. So these are some of the various uh, in the designs that uh, Rupesh has looked at. And uh, this is a validation of the velocity field from in an existing experimental work on an impinging jet. And uh, this is the kind of picture that you get when you do the CFD, that there is a jet that is emanating out and we want to minimize the impact of the jet. In, in an alternate design. And uh, so there are various designs that he has considered. One of them is actually putting a conical container so that the turbulence is gradually dissipated inside that and the outside zones are fairly quiet. And uh, then he de defined a measure of how to characterize how quiet the equipment is. And based on that, he has progressed through a design. So this is what I call a, a pa change in the design paradigm for chemical equipment. We can use design optimization in looking at the internals, which was never possible before and never done by chemical industry. Uh, this is about uh, erosion mechanism. This is very common in oil sands industry because you have sand being processed all the time with the oil and water. And this was done in collaboration with Professor Jimmy Lo. So the point here was how to predict what would be the erosion rate so that you can predict the failure of equipment that is uh, handling a lot of uh, sand. So we, uh, the Syncru, which sp sponsored an industrial company which sponsored this work, they actually built the experimental device. So you have an impinging jet which will carry sand as a slurry at 6%, 12% concentration at very high velocity, 6 meters per second, etc. And you put your sample here and impinge it for 1 hour, 2 hours, 3 hours, and then take the sample and look at the erosion patterns. And the question was, can CFD predict that kind of an erosion pattern? And what we did was we set up a CFD simulation to, to look at the impinging jet. And then we did the DPM type of analysis where we leave 10,000 particles in the fluid to see where they go and where they hit. And at the time of impact, what is their velocity? What is their impact angle? So we collect all these data from simulation. And then uh, this is the model that we use for tracking the particles. And this is a model, an empirical model, for predicting how much of material will be lost by erosion for each impact. Okay, that depends on the mass of the particle, the velocity of the particle, the impact angle of the particle, plus a lot of the material properties, the material strength of these. So using this correlation, then we, we were able to predict what would be the shape. So what you see here is uh, ex experimentally measured patterns of what the erosion is. So even though it is impinging right at the center, there's not as much loss there as in the surrounding. That is what experiments predicted. 
and uh, uh, the, the experiment found and the CFD can predict the same kind of a behavior. The reason, the, 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 the reason that this happens is when a solid particle impacts, particularly sand impacts at an angle, it can cut the material. Whereas if it impacts at 90 degrees, it is only by fatigue that it will fail. Okay? So it takes fatigue, uh, takes a longer number of impacts to erode, whereas cutting erodes it much more quickly. So we are able to then validate the model that we are using, which combines actually both the mechanism of uh, fatigue failure and cutting mechanism. And this is a quantitative comparison of what is the weight loss distribution on a circumferentially averaged. So here, if you take an average around the circumference and plot along the radial direction, what is the material, material weight loss, this is the kind of profile that we get. One of, this is experiment, and uh, one of the models that we developed is this one that agrees very well. But there are some models in the literature that will actually predict the maximum erosion at the center, which are not uh, found to be true. And this is the total weight loss over a period of time uh, as a function of inlet velocity. <coughs> okay, and with uh, this last one, I will conclude. This is a uh, deep water oil spill that, that <coughs> work is currently going on. And it's a very complex process. What happens here is as the oil that comes out 5,000 feet below, it is under pressure. It has a lot of dissolved gases in it. As it rises due to buoyancy, the pressure decreases and the dissolved gas can come out as a gas plume. So you will have an oil plume and a gas plume that will come out. And the gas, the lighter hydrocarbons in the gas has sufficient solubility that they can actually dissolve in the ocean water. So by the time it reaches the surface, it, you don't see any gas. Even though we know that this gas in the BP spill had a very high gas oil ratio, 2,000 uh, cubic feet per barrel. Okay? But still, when they measured the concentration of methane, there was very little to be found. And uh, in fact, some field experiment took place within a year of that. And what they found was at a depth of about 1,000 meters, there was an increased concentration of methane all around. So they were going around. This is the spill area. They were measuring all around. And they found that spike. Everywhere else, the methane concentration in the ocean was almost close to zero, but there was a spike. So the question is, how does this happen? Why, do, uh, why does it happen? Can we understand it by using CFD type of modeling? That's one of the questions that uh, Abhijit Rao and uh, Rupesh uh, are, are exploring right now. So there are a lot of mechanisms, as I said, gas release, hydrate formation, which is a phase change from the gas to the solid phase because it is very cold deep down uh, in the, near the valve. And the dissolution of the lighter material that I talked about, and the formation of the intrusion layers, which is what causes this kind of a, a behavior. So some of the preliminary results are uh, this simulation is, remember, we need to validate. Whenever we develop a two-fluid-based model, we need to validate our uh, model. So we took some experimental data that was done in a water column at, I think, MIT. And they had oil and gas that they were releasing with a very small cross flow, 2 centimeters per second, and a larger cross flow, 10 centimeters per second. And what you find is when you have small cross flow, the gas and the oil do not separate. The trajectory is almost like this. And that's what we find from a CFD simulation also. Okay? But when you have a higher cross flow, the oil goes like this, but the gas still has a larger rise velocity. So the two plumes separate very uh, quickly. And uh, there is a simple model in the original proposal, in the pro original report, that says the average trajectory will be something like this. But when you do a CFD simulation, you can actually predict that the gas trajectory is going to be like this and the liquid trajectory is going to be like that. This is superimposed that you see here. Okay? So this kind of a large scale model can tell us something about where the plumes go. But the real challenge is the scale of the problem because the scale from the well bore to the entire ocean changes quite dramatically. And we need in information about the ocean currents and stuff like that to be actually able to track that. And that, I think, will remain a big challenge for a number of years. But as I said, there are a number of other challenges. And one of them is to predict what the droplet size is. Because the rise velocity of these plumes depend very much on what the drop, droplet size is. And uh, we really have no clue as to what the droplet size is from a practical point of view. So there are some experiments uh, that um, Sutani and Adams did in 2001 that shows how the droplet breaks up over a whole range of Reynolds number. And this is really close to, uh, close to reality where there are literally thousands and thousands of droplets. So you cannot look at individual droplets. So we are just beginning to look at modeling in this regime. And uh, so here you will see a beautiful experiment by, designed by Rupesh and Abhijit. I hope it will work. So what you have is a droplet, a single droplet that is released that rises. Okay. 
and it will stop at some height and then it will start descending. Okay. So what is happening here is this is to simulate the process of dissolution of the lighter material from the oil droplet. The question is where, what is the fate of these droplets? Okay. So in this case what happens is it, it, the droplet consists of two materials, acetone and orthochlorobenzene or something like that. So you can adjust their proportion so that the density is lighter than the water. So initially it rises. But as it rises, the acetone has a lot of solubility in water. So they dissolve. So the, uh, the droplet becomes denser and denser. So as it becomes the same density as the drop of water, it stops there and it continues to lose acetone. And then it drops further. Okay. So this kind of information is important because we can understand what is the rate of mass transfer of acetone into the water. We can then take that model and apply to the oil field where we can ask the question, what is the dissolution rate of methane into the ocean water, for example. So this is the trajectory and then he has developed a model, uh, a lumped model, just looking at the drag and the buoyancy forces, including the mass transfer, coupling the mass transfer with the momentum transfer. But it is a very simplistic one-dimensional model. All it can predict is the trajectory. By matching the trajectory, observed trajectory with the predicted one, we can back calculate what the rate of mass transfer is. We can then use that in a CFD model if you want. Okay, and this is uh, the, the experiment that is, uh, the, the pr project that is ongoing, a match between the predicted, but this is really not a prediction. We are using it to tune what the mass transfer coefficient is going to be, okay, under one set of experiment. We can then validate that by repeating the experiment at a different particle size or a different concentration because the mass transfer process must be the same, independent of the size and the shape. And this one shows you how the droplet breaks up. Okay, so here you have a jet and over a certain length it forms a droplet and then continues. This is a fully resolved simulation uh, using a level set type of a method. And again from that report there are experimental data on what is the uh, length of the jet before it breaks up. Obviously if you inject at a higher velocity the, it's going to take a longer length before it breaks up. And that's what uh, this graph shows again from CFD simulation compared with the experiment. And uh, this is uh, the last slide I will show and then I will conclude my talk. Uh, this one uh, shows a simulation where we have three situations. One, there is no surfactant. In the, remember, in the BP oil there was a surfactant that was injected. In the second one, there is a surfactant that is injected with a moderate concentration and with a higher concentration from the side. What you see is the droplet that break up they don't further break up very significantly because the interfacial tension is what determines that. But once these are coated, then they break up into really tiny droplets. So through this kind of an experiment, if we can do a similar experiment, then we can look at from the prediction what is the droplet size distribution and match it with the experiments. And that will give us confidence in modeling the breakup processes, the surface tension uh, and the mass transfer of the surface, uh, uh, the surfactant onto the fluid. And again, that's a part of the work that is ongoing. So let me just move on to the concluding slide. I have another 150 slides, but uh, I don't want to keep you here. Let me just go to So what have we learned from all this uh, various studies on multiphase flow? Okay? Spatial variations of the phases are important. If you have multiphase flow, they are not going to be homogeneous. In some region, you will have some clusters of particles or droplets, and we need to understand that because the rate transfer processes, whether it is heat or mass transfer or chemical reaction, depends on what these phase distributions are. So it is very important to understand the heterogeneity in that. The other lesson is we don't really need to track every droplet and every particle to understand the large scale structures, and that is a very computationally demanding task. Okay, so we can use an averaged behavior, but restrict the averaging to the proper scale, the scale that is larger than the dispersed scale, but smaller than the equipment scale. So that if you average it over the equipment scale, we have this um, Aspen type of a model. If you don't average at all, you have the DNS type of a model. So we need to tread that scaling uh, properly. And so the concept of interpenetrating continua is adequate for most of the chemical process modeling. And uh, the question is the same class of closure models if you use, for example, if you have a drag model that you use in a sedimentation device as well as in pneumatic conveying, they seem to work. As long as the interaction between the faces are governed by the same processes, similar class of uh, closure models will be useful. Um, <coughs> it is difficult to predict the flow regime transitions. Still, that is not possible. So DNS can help us in understanding 
when certain structure clusters form and uh, why they form. Okay. And I had some interesting flow, spontaneous flow pattern uh, presentations, but I guess in the interest of time, I'm uh, going to leave that out. So the challenges are to develop scale invariant closure models. What do I mean by that? If I did an experiment on a pilot scale and I'm able to predict what happens there, the same model should be able to predict the field scale. Then I can cut down the need for pilot scale experiments, which are very expensive. Okay. And uh, the <coughs> developed models that remain valid across flow regimes, as I said, that is a real challenge. And the opportunities are we have advances in computational techniques that allow us to handle larger and larger classes of problems. We have advances in experimental technique that allow us to probe in great detail what is the spatial distribution inside such process vessels. And we have advances in direct numerical simulation algorithms that allow us to also probe the structure formation uh, from a computational side. So experimental side and computational side DNS will provide information for the TFM type of models that we can use. Acknowledgements, this is none of this is my work. These are all work and done by all my graduate students, present and past, and various colleagues who have taught me, taken me into new areas, uh, which I've always enjoyed, working on fuel cells or working on polymer processing, uh, working on oil sands, uh, now on sugar industry. So it has been a very uh, wonderful journey for me, and I want to thank all of them for that, and I want to thank you for your time. And I apologize for taking more time. <laughs> Thank you. Time for all questions.